God bless you. You're awesome. And what a privilege it is to be here with you. Uh, my mum and dad did call me Matthew, but how many people know that mums and dads don't really choose names? The school playground does. And so I got Wiley. Uh, my last name's Wile Smith. Don't be confused. I'm not Will Smith, I, uh, even though I look very similar uh, to Will Smith. I am Wile Smith, and most people call me Wiley. You can call me that if you so desire. If that's what your heart desires, you can call me Wiley Coyote or Wiley Cyrus, if you want. May or may not come in like a wrecking ball. Uh, we'll see what the Lord wants to do today. Uh, I'm from a place called Newcastle. And if you don't know where Newcastle is, you'll find it at the bottom of the NRL ladder. And that's where they'll remain if God answers my prayers. I don't like the Knights. I don't want anything to do with them. Is any Newcastle fans here? Just one shy one? <laughs> no, no. Repent and be baptised. No, just kidding. I'm a Cronulla shark. Yeah? Yeah? Baby shark. Do, 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 baby shark. I'm just all about it. Nico Heinstein. No one knows him. Nah. Yeah. All right. Probably should do what I'm supposed to do, right? Yeah, start the clock. No. Um, real privilege. Thanks, Pastor Danny and Pastor Joe, um, you know, for having myself and my whole family here. And you guys... I'm, I'm an ACC boy from the Australian Christian churches. Uh, my church is called Hope You See. And uh, but I feel like we share the same DNA. Even just having dinner with Pastor Danny last night and Joe and, and the family and Becca. And you, you're just amazing. And the worship. I mean, your worship, like the team, it's the whole, you guys are hungry. And it's, it's wonderful. So I feel like uh, we share the same DNA. So anyway, um, great. I'll tick that one off the list. Now, I just want to share... Uh, Four what-if questions today. Is that okay? Some questions from the life of a great pioneer called Moses. So if you would please, if you have a, a Bible, would you turn to Exodus chapter 2? We'll begin our reading there this morning. Whilst you're turning there, just a little bit of context. So at the end of Genesis, we have Jacob and Joseph and they die out. Uh, they pass on and... Then we have Moses, baby Moses, a little Hebrew boy. And Pharaoh, a new king, rises and he's angry. He's upset. He's mad because God's people are multiplying. All right? They're becoming fruitful, which was God's promise for them. And he was threatened by their multiplication, by their growth. And so he decided to take out every baby boy, every baby boy that was born. He said, throw them into the Nile River and, and drown them, kill them off. But Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, uh, they actually hid Moses for a number of months. And then they actually saved his life by putting him into a little basket and floating him on the river of death itself, the Nile River. Uh, a lot of meaning in that. But you know, it's really beautiful is that the Hebrew word for basket uh, is actually the same Hebrew word for bar- for Ark in Noah's Ark. It's a word pronounced Tavar. And there's a link here because uh, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 2 that Moses' parents, they actually coated this little basket in pitch and tar. Noah, he coated his ark in pitch and tar and they did that to waterproof these uh, the basket and, and the ark. And so we quickly find a link between Noah and Moses. Moses is the new Noah. He's the man, the pioneer here, who is actually to save God's People, it, it's actually a pro- profound thought. Uh, Noah takes people uh, through water to a new land. Moses is about to take people through water to a new land, the, the promised land. And what's interesting is that from birth, Moses had this leader in him. He had he was Moses, the liberator from birth, and, and as as he grows, it, it, he struggles to know what to do with what God has put inside of him, who, who he truly is. And it's interesting, so we're going to go through this story um, today. Uh, but let's, let's read the scriptures. Um, we pick the story up where, sorry, I'll just quick give you a little bit more. So Moses is in the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter providentially finds him. Um, he goes back into the arms of his mother for some time. And then at the right time, uh, God's time, Moses' mother returns baby Moses to Pharaoh's daughter to raise him in the palace. Are you with me? Is that all right? Here we go. Let's get on with it. Uh, Exodus chapter 2 and reading from verse 10. When the child grew older, Moses, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. 
She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Verse 11, one day Moses had grown up. He went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating one of his own, a Hebrew. Uh, verse 12, looking this way and that and seeing no one around, he kills the Egyptian and he hit him on the sand. Not a good idea because when sand shifts, right, limbs are flailing out. And this is what happens. Okay, verse 13, the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked uh, the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and he thought, what I did must have become known. And from there, Moses flees uh, into the desert and he spends 40 years there. And uh, let's pray. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. And we pray, come. Come, Holy Spirit. You are here, you're present with us, but come in power. Come more and more. Come and speak to us. Our hearts are open this morning. I pray that the loudest voice this morning in this room would be your still small voice whispering to our hearts. I thank you that it's your heart's desire to speak to us, cause us to be able to read between the lines this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. First, what if thought around Moses the pioneer is this. What if we train today regardless of what tomorrow brings? What if we trained today regardless of what tomorrow brings? We don't know what tomorrow brings will bring. Moses didn't know what his future was. He had the leader and liberator inside of him, but he didn't know what to do with that. Nevertheless, Moses trained. See, Moses spent 40 years in Egypt. Seemingly, Moses, a man seemingly marked for a life of obscurity and poverty. Moses is providentially uh, brought up in the upper echelon of society in, in Egypt. Acts 7 verse 22 says this. this is the, these are the words of Stephen. He says, Moses was educated. Everyone say, educated. educated. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Moses in the palace receives a remarkable education. He receives training. At that particular time, Egypt was the superpower of the day. It was said to be the most technologically advanced nation in the world at that time. And so Moses is here for 40 years receiving a palace education. He didn't know what was to come, but he stayed and he trained and he trained and he read and he read and he learned and he learned and he trained and he trained regardless of what tomorrow brought. For 40 years, he remained in Egypt. So you've got to remember that God's plan for Moses went well beyond all of the wonderful miracles that he experienced in his life. I mean, what a life. He liberated millions of people from slavery in Egypt. There were Red Seas. There was manna from heaven. There were hitting rocks and water pouring out of rocks. There was all sorts of different miracles, all, all sorts of wild God experiences. He pioneered the, the Ten Commandments, the laws of the land, this, that, and the other. But God's plan actually went even further than that. Where, where, what am I getting at? God was preparing Moses. God was training Moses to write what? The very book that we are engaging with today and that we ought to engage every day of our life. Moses wrote the Torah. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. There's a lot of important things in there. Creation, the fall of man, sin, God's plan for gender and, and sexuality and, and marriage and this and that. I mean, there's a, I mean, it's quite a powerful book, wouldn't you agree? See, God's plan went well beyond that. Moses didn't know when he was there in Egypt, he didn't know what tomorrow held for him. He didn't really know where he was going. He didn't know what God was calling him to, but he stayed and he trained and he trained and he trained and he trained. You see, you've got to understand, sometimes God wants to do something in you and prepare you then to do a work through you. And even though it doesn't look pretty, even though it doesn't look spectacular, how many people know as Christians, we're not called to chase a spectacular life, but to live a significant life, a significant life in Christ Jesus. Forget the spectacular, forget the Instagram, this, that, and the other. No, live a significant life in Jesus. And it doesn't always look pretty. I mean, Moses was obviously frustrated. He killed a man because of his frustration. 
that God has placed something on the inside of you and perhaps you're frustrated. There's, you can't articulate what it is. Well, Moses couldn't, but he trained and he trained and he trained and he read and he read and he got into all, all of the different articles of reading and, and, and he learned and because God, see, Moses is no, he's no dummy. Moses was a smart individual. He was sharp. God said, I don't need someone who's just got an open heart. I need somebody who is well-educated, who is disciplined, who is well-trained. Because I need this man to write the first five books of my word so that lives could be changed in orange, in a, in a church called Colour City Church, years and years and years and years from now. See, Moses doesn't know that I'm here preaching the very words that he wrote. He didn't know in Egypt uh, for 40 years. He had no idea that God was training and preparing him to, to mark on this, on the parchment, the very words that I would be preaching today. And you do not know the impact and influence you will have one day when you are gone, the legacy that you will build. Every decision you make today is a brick in the wall of the legacy that you are building for generations to come. Not just the next generation, but generations to come. So today, are you training? Are you training? Are you training? There's a saying in the Navy SEALs, a famous saying, that nobody, nobody rises to the occasion. People simply fall to the level of their training. So the question is, how's your training? How's your training? How well do you not just know the word, but the God of the word, right? How well do we know Jesus? You know, the, the issue is, I think, for a lot of people, particularly today, is that we get our beginning place wrong. And I explained this to some of the leaders yesterday. When, when it comes to something, an issue that we do not understand, we get our beginning place wrong when forming or shaping a belief system about that particular issue. What a person generally does is they look at it and they go, what's my experience when it comes to this issue? And they reason from their experience and they shape a belief system from their experience. And secondly, they'll say, what does society say about this particular issue? What does social media say? Uh, what does Facebook say? What does Twitter say? What does Twitface say? And all these other different interesting things that are out there in the Twitter sphere universe of social media. Well, what does the media say? Let's get out the Telegraph. Let's get out this, with the Sydney Morning Herald. Let's have a read. What's the local trading post saying about this? And, and they'll shape a belief system based on what... The news says, or they perhaps might talk to friends and ask family and distant relatives, hey, well, what, do you, what do you think about this particular issue? And then lastly, because they're a Christian, they think, oh, gee, I, well, I better, better have a read of the word and see what God says. I might have a pick and flick, you know, a good old pick and flick. Anyone? A bit of a pick and a, yep, no, nah, just in Newcastle. Anyway, <laughs> and they, they pull out the word and, and they, they have a look. And the problem is, if this doesn't match that, right, if the word of God doesn't match their experience around that issue, if the Word of God doesn't match what society says around that issue, what their friends say, what Instagram says, what their family say, a person has a tendency, that person, to deconstruct this and pull this apart and change this until this matches that, until the Bible matches their experience, until the Bible matches what society says. But I'm telling you, this should speak to that. Because all of a sudden we have an individual renovating the Word of God through the lens of a broken heart rather than having their broken heart renovated by the Word of God. This should speak into society. This should transform your community. This should transform your family. It should speak to your friends. Come on, people. We need to be a generation who trains in the Word of God. What if we train today regardless of what tomorrow brought? My family have had enough of me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Back to Newcastle. My son's waving to me. See you, Dad. You suck. <laughs> Thanks, son. Second thought. Is this all right? Second thought. What if we knew the power of a desert season? What if we knew the power of a desert season? We use big metaphors in, in church all the time, giants and mountains and seas and deserts. And I'll talk to that, but pick up the story in, in chapter 3 if, if you're there, because Moses goes off into the next 40 years of his journey in the desert. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, uh, Jethro, uh, who was a priest in the land of Midian. Anyway, he comes to Mount Horeb, later known as Mount Sinai. And there, here in verse 2, there, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames. This is just stunning. Flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it 
wasn't consumed. It didn't burn up. So Moses thinks, I will go over and see this strange sight. It's an interesting line, isn't it? Why isn't the bush burning up? God calls to him then from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But this Moses hid his face. Um, This here is an encounter moment, a desert season that Moses is in. He he has one of the most remarkable God encounters. Uh, A desert season. What, what what, What am I talking about for you? Well, a desert season, perhaps you feel distant from God. A a dry season, perhaps you haven't heard his voice in a long time or perhaps ever before. It could be a cushy season, maybe comfort, right? Maybe comfort is the challenge. Maybe God's calling you to courage and not a life of comfort. It could be a frustrating season, a challenging season like Moses in the palace. I'm not sure why I'm here. Maybe there's just not a lot going on. It could be a barren season. You're waiting on a miracle or perhaps you have been praying for a miracle and you didn't receive that miracle. Whatever that season is to you, a desert season. But today I want to say this to you, never underestimate the power of a desert season for Moses saw far more of God in the desert than he ever did in the palace. Moses first met God in the desert. Moses first heard God's voice in the desert. He had one of the most famous encounters in history where? In a desert season. Moses, a very ordinary individual, is a shepherd at this particular point. Very ordinary individual with a very ordinary job. And he has one of the most remarkable God encounters that we read in the Word. And this was the place where his destiny is revealed. He can now articulate what that was inside of him. What is that? That leader, that liberator. You see, we don't know what to do with that. God has placed that in us. And that's why we need to train. We need to encounter God. We need to have a burning bush moment in order to know what to do with our tomorrow with the call that God has for our lives. The scripture says, when the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. See, notice this. It wasn't until Moses moved toward the bush that God spoke from the bush. Notice that. It, it was a sweet sequence of events. Moses moves first, God speaks second. Isn't that just interesting? Draw near to him and he will draw near to you, as as James teaches us. Moses draws near, then God draws near. Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 31, powerful verse. But those who wait upon the Lord. Who loves waiting? Yeah, no, maybe not. But those who wait upon the Lord, um, their strength shall be renewed. This this word here, Wait actually is a word in the Hebrew pronounced kava. There's a number of interpretations, but what it essentially means is to expect, to look eagerly for. And it's interesting because looking eagerly for something and waiting, they, they don't really seem like the same. They don't seem aligned to me. But in our desert seasons, and here's the thought, in our desert seasons, when we feel like it's a little dry and a little bit barren and we're not quite close to God, we can draw near to Him in our waiting seasons, right? Rather than waiting for something. Because if we just sit around waiting for something to happen in our today, I'm just going to wait for something to happen, I'm going to wait for something to happen. When something doesn't happen, when we don't receive our miracle, we're disappointed time and time again. We just, and, we, and then we, we misunderstand the character of God. Oh, well, God just wants to, He, he, wants, he sees me as a disappointment. And, and, and that's not the nature of God at all. It's, it's just that we're getting the whole waiting thing wrong. You see, we can wait for something or we can spend our our time eagerly looking for someone. We can eagerly look for God. Where are you in this? What are you trying to do? Are you, are you refining me? We, we can eagerly look for him in the waiting season. Moses saw far more of God in the desert season, in that waiting season than he did in a busy, busy world. It says something about society, doesn't it? Third thought, what if we were more aware of who God is then who we're not? What if we were more aware of who God is than who or what we're not? Um, Reading on, you still with me? Verse 7 of chapter 3, the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out 
because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering, so I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land uh, into a good and spacious land, a land flowing of milk and honey. Uh, I love that God doesn't just save us from something, but he saves us to something else. There's new life for you. Uh, Verse 9, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you, this is the call, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, well, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship me on this very mountain. And verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I do go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I say? And and here we go. It's quite confusing. But God says to Moses, I am who I am. Everybody say, I am. am. Tell them that it's I am who sent me. Um, You can play that out. We could play that out. It'd be fun. Moses goes to the people and they say, who is it that sent you? And Moses says, I am. Sorry, what? Who, who, Who sent you? I am. It's a little bit confusing, isn't it? You can see how that would play out. Uh, The word here uh, is, is Yahweh. Uh, the Lord, we read it in the, in the English, in the, the translation that we have as the Lord, meaning self-existent. And I'm sure you know this, self-existent. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is all sufficiency, not dependent upon you, not dependent upon me. God doesn't need us, but he wants to use us, right? He wants to have a relationship with us. That's why he created us. And Moses' response to God's call, very similar to a lot of people in the Bible, he, he says a number of things. His fears are revealed. Who, who, who am I to go? Has anyone ever said that to God? You're in you today. God's calling you into something tomorrow. It it's requires a step of faith, and then fear comes up. Verse 11, here's a number of Moses' fears. He says, who am I to go? He fears not being good enough, inadequacy. Verse 13, what do I tell them? He fears not being ready and prepared, Right? Chapter 4, further fears, verse 1, what if they don't believe me? He fears failure. Anyone relate with this? Verse 10, I don't have the right gifts, Lord. I am slow of speech. He fears that he isn't gifted enough. Verse 13, send somebody else, right? Have you ever, come on, send somebody else. God's calling you out of comfort into a a new place and it's like, eh, send somebody else. I have said that to God so many times. I am inadequate. I am not good enough. I am a failure. I am without talent and gift. I am useless. I am unloved. By the way, um, I've heard it once said that the greatest lie you can ever believe is that you are unloved. That is not true. You are loved. Yet we, 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 all these fears can rise in us. I am this, I am that. And forgive me for the play on words this morning, but ultimately God's response, God's answer to all of those fears, all of your fears is this, what you aren't. I am what you aren't. I am. I am more than adequate. I am more than enough. My grace is more than sufficient for you. I am strong when you are weak. I am love. I am grace. I am the Prince of Peace. What you aren't, I am. And that's what God says to you this morning. If God is calling you out of comfort uh, from the desert into some other, maybe He's calling you to the desert, wherever God is calling you and whatever it is that He has for you in your future. He's gone before you. He is with you. He is behind you. He is all around you. It doesn't matter your fear. Do you know what's interesting about faith versus fear? Because faith isn't a feeling, right? But sometimes it feels a little bit like fear. Are you with me? Do you really think that when Peter stepped out of the boat, he, he had the feeling of courage and bravery? Do you really think that that's how he felt in that moment? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that's how Peter actually felt in the moment. You imagine that. It's almost like sometimes taking a step of faith can feel fearful. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's not that the, fe- the feeling might not go away. It's almost like in hindsight, you know, oh, it's actually faith. The feeling might not necessarily go away in the moment, but it's faith because you're taking a step regardless of the feeling. Are you with me? 
oh, I'm still, still a little bit scared here, God, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna believe. It's going to feel, and I just want to empathize with you this morning. It's gonna feel fearful. You're still gonna be a little bit scared, but it's taking a step regardless of the feeling. Because faith supersedes feelings. What if we became more aware of who God is rather than who we're not? You know, growing up, like I, I feared uh, not making friends when I changed school in year three. I feared my mum and dad never getting back together. When I was 12, my, my father, who was a minister, we, we pioneered a church from Sydney to Newcastle. My father was unfaithful to my mother, had an affair with, with a keyboard player. Thank God you guys don't have the keyboard set up today. <laughs> PTSD. Stay away from keyboard players now. Nah. <laughs> I'm still not hurt. Um, you know, at that particular point, I became insecure and anxious and all these sorts of things. And it was at that point, you know, that I, because I think it's Leo Tol- Tolstoy, it's a famous saying, we want the, to paraphrase, we, we all want the world to change or we want to change the world, but we fail to realize that we are the ones that need change. Paraphrase, big paraphrase there. But, but I realized in that point, I'm like, I want them to get back together. I, I want things to be fixed, but I had to change. I had to change. And so that, that's when I gave my heart to Christ. I received forgiveness from my past, new life today and hope for the future in Jesus. And you too can if you're new this morning. But, but, but I, I, I had fears though. I still had fears in that period of time not that my parents wouldn't get back together. I feared university. I feared missing out on soccer teams. Didn't happen very often. Um, I feared missing God's call for my life. I, I feared being a, a, a terrible husband. I feared rejection. I still do sometimes today. I, I, I feared not having the ability to have kids. And, and when I did have kids I, I, today, I fear not being a very good parent. I fear not having the ability to, to raise them. We all have fears, but we can, we can cling on to faith. How much time do I have? Oh, great. That's really? That's awesome. All right. Uh, let's go to Revelation then. <laughs> How about no? <laughs> Oh, I'll never be invited back, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> September 7, 1941, was the beginning of the Blitzkrieg, right, which is the German bombings of London. Um, went on for a few years, World War II, really, really horrible. But there's a famous story that rose from the ashes of, of these horrific events that transpired. And there was a father... Um, And he takes his son by the hand and they're fleeing from a busted up building. A bomb had just smashed into a nearby building. And you you can just picture the scene. It's just chaos and anarchy everywhere. And and the father is fleeing for his life and he takes his son by the hand. and, And he sees a big shell hole in the ground, a giant shell hole. And so he dives into the shell hole. But his son is left on the edge of the shell hole. And the father looks up at the son and he's yelling, jump! come on boy, jump. And the boy's on the edge of the shell hole and and he looks into the hole, but he can't see his father. And he says, father, I can't see anything. I can't jump because I can't see anything. And the father looks up and, and, and he can see the pink and red tinted sky. And he says to the silhouette of his son, I know that you can't see me, but I can see you jump. And with that, the son jumps and his life is spared. See, our faith enables us to walk this narrow path to life, in life, in certainty, not because we can see, but because we are seen by God. We are seen by God. We jump not because we have all the answers, but because we are known by the answer himself. See, answers aren't found in who we are or who we aren't, but the answers are found in who God is. What I love about this passage, beautiful in verse 7. Then the Lord said, I've read this already, but I just want to go over this. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know, everybody say no. I know their sufferings. In verse 8, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. You see four words here. God has seen you. God has heard you. God knows your suffering. You know, one of my revelations over the years when it comes to teenagers, I work with teenagers, uh, is that we have taught teenagers 
how to seek success, but not how to suffer. Who suffered in this room before? Oh, goodness me, suffering. God knows your suffering. God knows what you're going through. He suffered. He suffered on, on your behalf. God has come down in the person of Jesus and he has delivered you. This is who God is. God is the God who sees you, hears you, and knows your suffering. He's the God who delivers you. What if we were more aware of that God, of who God is, rather than who we're not? And the team can come. The final thought is this. What if, what if we were a burning bush for others? What if we were a burning bush for others? Amen, brother. What if we were a burning bush for others? Um, you know, this was an average, small ordinary bush sometimes I feel pretty average I am actually I am small (laughs) very ordinary but I can be set on fire by the presence of God and not be consumed but I can be a burning bush for others what I find interesting is that Wonderful um, clip over there. (laughs) What I find interesting is that God showed who he was to Moses before he told Moses who he was, right? God showed who he was to Moses before he told Moses who he was. It's interesting because what caused Moses to move towards God? Well, I I mean, it was a bush that wasn't burning out. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen any bushes around orange uh, that are set on fire and not being consumed, right? I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's miraculous. So God is showing his power. God is showing his miraculous power. That, a bush being burned and not being consumed, is impossible. God is showing Moses, I am the God of the impossible. I am the all-consuming fire but I can burn and somebody and something cannot be consumed. It's just remarkable. God showed his power to Moses. I wonder if we, right, we could live our lives in such a way where we show Christ before we talk about Christ. Now, I'm all, I'm passionate about preaching God, like obviously, but it's all of it. See, people need to be seen, heard and known as we are seen, heard and known. I just read, I just read that. And so I just wonder if we would take the time to get to know somebody's story first, Win that person over, get to know them, build a relationship with them. And in turn, I guarantee you, you will one day get an opportunity to share Jesus. And by the way, I get this backwards. I'm very passionate, I'm an evangelist. I just want to go straight there for the jugular. And, and there's, there's times to do that. You got to be, you got to know, you got to, you know, have the intelligence to work that out. Or if you don't have that, just the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you, right? Be trained in His Word and you'll know what to say at the, at the right time. But I just wonder what would happen. Um, evangelist and author Leonard Ravenhill says this, You never have to advertise a fire, right? People just come running to fires. I thought, isn't that an interesting thought? Uh, Very true. What if we showed Christ through our lives before first telling people about Christ? Um, There's a story, and I I shared this yesterday. You you might know the story, the famous story from 2015. um, Not that long ago, is it? Where ISIS, the terrorist organization, had taken captive 21 Christians from Libya and they'd taken them to Egypt, right, speaking of Egypt, and they, they lead these men down to a beach, they dress them in orange jumpsuits and they put Hessian bags over their heads, chaining them all together, they ask them to kneel down and renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. And, and so there they are. You can picture the scene. It's a pretty horrible scene right there. These men taken captive. And they're on their knees, asked one by one to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, renounce your faith and turn to Allah. And if they said no, they would lose their life. And one by one, these men, as they, as they decided not to renounce their faith in Jesus, lost their lives. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Are you feeling the weight of that yet? Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. It gets to the twenty-first person, right? He's on his knees, and his name is Matthew Ayerga, 
All right, Matthew Ayerga, and it comes out later on. It was filmed, and in the transcript, it became known that Matthew Ayerga actually wasn't a Christian. Right? He just got caught, swept up in the in the in the situation, and swept out with all these Christians. And here he is finding himself in a situation where somebody is asking him to renounce the very faith he doesn't actually have. And he looks up at his oppressor, and, and he looks down the line, and he he looks up at his oppressor, and he looks down the line. He looks up at his oppressor and and he says this, Their God is my God. Their God is is my God. And at that, Matthew Ayurga lost his life. But you and I both know that that wasn't the moment that he lost his life. That, my friends, was the moment that he found his life. That was the moment that Matthew Ayurga found life in Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew Ayerga is not the hero of the story. He is the recipient of heaven, recipient of Christ Jesus and all that God has because of the lives that were laid down by these mighty men. I wonder if we lived our lives in such a way that that, that our lives were so laid down, so so, uh, surrendered to Jesus Christ, that others would see our lives and and we would live our lives in that way that we are this burning bush that just attracts others. And when we get this opportunity through relationship, through perhaps opening up our home, inviting someone over for a meal time and time again, perhaps then we'll get an opportunity to share the love of Christ with those people. In summary, what if we train today regardless of what tomorrow brings? What if we knew the power of a desert season? What if we were more aware of who God is and who we're not? And what if we were a burning bush for others? Now, I'm just going to finish here with this. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You know, what's interesting, uh, it's verse 16, is uh, it sounds very impressive until you work out very quickly that those three individuals are very flawed individuals. And... God speaking about these people in Hebrews, he says, God is not ashamed to be called their God, right? Uh, They were liars, those people, they were schemers, they were tricksters, but God's not ashamed to be called their God and God is not ashamed to be called your God either. And if you've never ever invited Christ into your heart, I'd love to invite you to do that today um, with the pastor's permission. Um, Would you just close your eyes across this place? I just want to say to you, Maybe you've never met Jesus before. You're just hearing me speak and there's just something on the inside of you just burning away and kindling. It's like, maybe you're sort of like, there's, there's something in me, I, uh, but I, I don't know who that is. Well, only God can reveal that to you. Maybe this is your burning bush moment. This is your encounter moment. And if you would just say yes to a relationship with Jesus, what you would be saying yes to is forgiveness from your past, new life today, purpose, and hope for the future, eternity with Christ in heaven and with the vast majority of individuals in this room. And I made this decision a long time ago as a teenager when I was a very broken person, but I realized I had to change. I had to change. And I put my hand up in a meeting like this. I said, yes to Jesus. And if that's you this morning, I'd love to pray a prayer with you to invite Christ into your heart. And if you've never done that before, perhaps today you want to realign your life with Him. If that's you, would you pop your hand up right now in this moment? so I can pray with you. No one's looking around. This is a private moment right now. Would you stand with me, church, as we pray together today? Father, I just thank you for for people in this room. I just pray right now, Holy Spirit. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would just do something in our hearts in this moment. Would you just open your hands if you feel comfortable just to receive something from the Holy Spirit? Lord, uh, if if we have fears, Lord, uh, we, we just lay these fears aside in this moment. We choose, Lord Jesus, to lay fear aside. Lord, I just pray that in this moment as we let go of fear and we take a hold of faith, Lord Jesus, and we surrender our hearts to you, I pray that you would come and you would begin to speak to people this morning. 
I know you already have, but in this very moment, come and minister to them. Lord, whatever the call is, perhaps um, you want to speak into their tomorrow. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you do that right now in this very moment. Lord Jesus, I just pray for people in this moment, but, but perhaps, Lord, you would challenge them, Lord, to be disciplined, to train. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would speak to them about that. God, perhaps people this morning, this moment, need a revelation of who you are because they've been, they've been thinking about and pondering who they're not. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, they would have a revelation of who you are in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said,